And then Iraq, tactical brilliance, lights the oil well fires. I mean, tactically, it's a perfect maneuver. You got to remember, in war, what's your job? To kill, period. So they light the oil well fires, beautiful tactical maneuver, and now everybody's getting sick because of the incomplete combustion of complex organics, inorganics, heavy metals, and everybody's getting sick. Now the headaches and all this stuff only lasted for a few minutes because, you know, your body was overwhelmed and didn't sense it anymore. Now everybody was looking for the good humor man. Now you ask, why do we need a good humor man? Well, the reason we need a good humor man is because we needed popsicle sticks. And so what we did is we took popsicle sticks and used that popsicle stick to scrape out the gunk out of your nose, out of your ears, and out of your mouth so you could survive. Um, the, the news of, Grandma said, don't stick your nose, finger up your nose, but baby, when that oil well fire residue hit you, you had to get it scraped out or you wouldn't, weren't going to get it sick right away, and everybody got sick. We issued an order that no matter what you did, everybody was supposed to wear respiratory and skin protection. But you got to understand, in the military, your job is to kill. And everybody turns into Rambo. Because you got all of these briefings from the commanders telling you, kill, kill, kill. And you're invincible, invincible, invincible. And they forget to tell you that all that's going to happen is you're going to die. Reality of war is that you kill and you die. And it doesn't matter whether you're a five-year-old child or a 90-year-old woman. Now, we got a lot of friends over there that are making peace sh the shields and peacekeepers right now. All you are is a target. Let you understand that. You either kill with us or we kill you. It's simple as that. Reality is. So now we got all of this stuff setting up and the continuing Rambo mentality that's in there. The war plan that is in place right now was started that I know of in 1995 and finished when we started doing what's called field training exercises, FTXs, and CPXs, command post exercises, by August of 1990. It was all ready to go. We're just waiting for an incident. We're just waiting for an incident. Reality is. So now you've got all of this stuff over there. We're all going. Now we get ready to go to war. Start the combat, the air war. <laughs> Jeez. We got to get everybody trained and educated. We forgot to tell, make sure everybody had the adequate military training and adequate military education in order to survive in war. And also that they knew how to kill proficiently. Now I'm an army doctor. I'm a health physicist. When I went to war, left Fort McCoy, Wisconsin, I had my own pick em up truck. I had my sergeant sit next to me. I had an M16 with 3,000 rounds. I had a 45 with 1,000 rounds. I had my medical bag on my hip. I had gas mask. Oh, my gas mask. Darn it. I forgot about gas masks. See, when you go into war for a nuclear biological chemical warfare, you've got to wear a gas mask. And you've got to wear a, what we call a mop suit, chemical protective clothing. Except for one thing. They don't work. They don't work. They didn't work during the Gulf War I, and they don't work now. So you got to protect yourself against all of this stuff. So you're going to put your gas mask on. Now, on, how many people saw 60 Minutes a week ago? We had a major story on this. Got a soldier right here that saw it. Now, the military, the M40 series gas mask that they issued to the soldiers, and you understand, I did the research for the Army on this when I was a director at the U.S. Army Chemical School at Fort McClellan, Alabama. The gas mask comes off of your face, and it leaks. Now, the Department of Defense, in all of their wisdom, when we started raising these questions with the United States General Accounting Office report, released last October, in the Army, what we call the Department of Army Investigation, DAIG, okay, verified they don't work. Now, Captain Cook, Major Captain Kukendall, up at the Public Affairs Office in the Pentagon, says, that's okay, they work. No, they don't work. So well, Kathleen Sullivan from the San Francisco Examiner and Chronicle said, well, Kukendall, what are you going to do? <laughs> I'm going to give them duct tape. 
the official response from the Pentagon for defective gas masks is to issue duct tape to our soldiers. <laughs> Just like everybody was buying duct tape here in plastic sheet to keep this stuff out that, you know, around your house here last week. Give me a break. How many of you people want your sons and daughters going to war with defective equipment and they've been issued duct tape? I don't. As an army officer, that's criminal. So we got all this stuff happening. The equipment that worked before doesn't work now. The education and training that the military is supposed to have and is required to have to survive in combat, they don't have. Now I know we got other soldiers in here that have trained at the same place I've worked at. Now one thing you watch on TV right now, it's real interesting, okay? You'll see these guys going to what we call small unit tactics, all right? And the small unit tactics, and now they're going to go into villages and towns and communities, which would be like having a battle out here on the street. But they've got to go house to house, building to building. Now, if you watch on TV, you're going to see these soldiers, and damn it, they're not worth a hill of beans. They're running up in a bunch. They're clumped together with their head up somebody else's butt. Because they figure, well, if I stay right together, I'll be okay. Dang it. That's the fastest way to die. One grenade, one burst of automatic weapons fire, one booby trap, and you're all dead. You space out big time. They're not teaching the kids these things. Because what is it? It's a Nintendo game. I can recycle a computer button and you can live again. Or this other idea, well, if I stay together, each other is going to take care of each other. No, you're going to die. In war, you kill and you die. It's not a Nintendo game. So we've got defective equipment. We've got inadequate training. And we've got hellacious weapons. Now, in December of 1990, I get a letter from the Pentagon, Colonel Charles Day. Now, you've got to understand. The Army itself doesn't send messages through its own chain of command because they know that nobody gets them. You know, it just doesn't work. I got soldiers shaking their heads because they know this for real. So Charles Day sent a letter through the U.S. mail because the U.S. mail, it always goes through wind, rain, or snow, right? It doesn't matter where it is. It always makes it. It's the only way you could communicate. And he said, think about depleted uranium. And I go, what's this? You know, let's see, I enlisted in the military in 1967, this is 1990, and I, I'm a health physicist, and I never heard of depleted uranium. It's a secret. A secret. And he said, you better be prepared for health and environmental consequences and the casualties of DEU. And I go, what's this? Now, you have to understand, I held my own pick -em up truck when I went to war. I drove my pick -em up truck onto a C5, I tied it down myself, left my rifle in my thing and went upstairs and sat down. We took off and we went to war. And we landed in Riyadh and I pulled off, loaded my M16 and my 45. Got to understand, I'm an Army doctor, but I'm going to always carry my M16 and 45. Why? What's your job? To kill, period. To kill, to kill, to kill. And if you don't kill, that other guy's going to kill you. And they don't care who you are or what you are. But I'm a scientist. I took lots of books along. Gotta understand, I had my own truck. I filled duffel bags worth of books. Because I knew when I went to war, I needed to know what was going on. I needed to have the information. Because nobody else has taken it. And the same thing with my medical bag. I stocked my medical bag up and I stole all kinds of medical supplies that I could from the Army Hospital at Fort McCoy and loaded them in my truck. And the other thing I took, I. I Went to the hotels and motels before we left. I got as many rolls of toilet paper as you could ever dream of. I had them shoved into every corner of that truck. It's real important. You ever try to go to the bathroom without toilet paper? Do you know what the hygiene disaster turns into within hours? It's real simple and you don't think about it. Now along with that, we got all these soldiers going to war into the desert. And they expect the porta potty to be put out there for them. <laughs> I don't know where they're going to get a porta potty in the middle of a desert, in the middle of a war. But ain't nobody taught them how to do a slit trench or dig a cat hole. 
They don't teach it. So what are you supposed to do? And excuse me, do it in your pants? They're not prepared. Not prepared at all. So I had all my books, and I said, depleted uranium, uranium emissions. Okay, I can look this up, and I started finding out, and I got scared, flat out scared. And then all of a sudden, the ground war happened. And ladies and gentlemen, the majority of casualties during Gulf War I on the United States side, direct combat casualties, which means both dead and wounded, were due to friendly fire, which means the United States shot up the United States troops. An individual in a Bradley fighting vehicle or an Abrams tank deliberately and willfully got a target in sight and goes, I got a target! My job's to kill! And they killed and shot up the Abrams and Bradley tanks and they got all the guys inside of it. And then we had an Apache pilot, you know, Colonel. <laughs> I'm an Apache. Oh, I can fly and I can kill. And he gets a target out there and he launches a Hellfire missile and takes out a Bradley fighting vehicle and everybody in it. By the way, I just pushed those guys in a hole in the ground. I couldn't get them out of there. We buried them in a hole in the ground at KKMC, King Khalid Military City. They shot everybody up with uranium munitions. And they forgot to tell people how to protect themselves. In fact, as far as I can confirm just a few minutes ago, as far as 1999, they're not teaching the kids about depleted uranium munitions. Is that correct, Sergeant? Bradley Sergeant, right here, U.S. Army, 1999. They're not teaching them yet. And all of a sudden, they realized they screwed up. I got a direct order, and this is unbelievable. I still don't know why it happened. A direct order from Norman G. Schwarzkopf, Central Command, and it's up here if you want to read it, signed by his chief of staff to clean up the depleted uranium mess. Well, I'm going to finish the job. Simple as that. And they don't like it. We got up there, and there's only three words to describe it. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. The casualties, crispy critters, the wounds, the injuries, the destroyed vehicles, the contamination was so extensive that it's almost beyond comprehension. Now, you have to understand, depleted uranium munitions, or there's nothing depleted about them. They are solid uranium-238. Each individual round fired by an Abrams tank is a giant pencil of uranium-238. It's 3 quarters of an inch in diameter and 18 inches long and weighs over 10 pounds. They're not coated or not tipped. You're going to see in the news, you're going to see the Department of Defense try to tell you they're coated, they're tipped. They're not. They're solid uranium-238. Each individual round, three-quarters of an inch in diameter, 18 inches long, and weighs over 10 pounds. Now we have the, Ab the uh, Warthog aircraft, the A-10, a tank killer. This thing's a killing machine. It's awesome, because in war, your job is to kill. To kill, to kill, to kill. I don't care whether you're a medic, a cook, a Bradley, a grunt that runs on the ground. I don't care if you're male or female. I don't care what your job is to kill. Now that Warthog aircraft fires a DU round. Each individual round is three quarters of a pound of solid uranium-238. And it fires it at 4,000 rounds a minute. That's a ton and a half of uranium per minute. What's your job in war? To kill, period. And so they swooped down and they shot everything up. Well, we fired over 350 tons of solid uranium. That's 350 tons of just uranium. Doesn't have anything to do with our shells or the gunpowder. It's strictly solid uranium. And we left it in the desert. Now, when this DU round impacts, this sucker is a killing machine. We call it the silver bullet because that round comes flying through the air in the minute it leaves the tube of the gun, which is the bore of the gun, the muzzle, whatever you want to call it, that sucker's on fire. And it flies through the air, and no matter what it hits, and ladies and gentlemen,